A man walked into a bank wearing no mask, wearing no hat, no sunglasses, and he had a gun, and he robbed the bank at gunpoint in broad daylight, and he left. And then he went to another bank, (laughs) no hat, no sunglasses, no mask, with his gun, and he robbed that bank. And then he went home, and then the police came. And they looked at the security footage. This was 1995, so they had security cameras. And they got a nice picture of the man who robbed the bank. They played it on the nightly news. And they got tips really quick. And they went to his house, and they arrested him. <laughs> it was the, name, uh, the name of the man was MacArthur Wheeler. And when they showed up at MacArthur Wheeler's door, he was completely floored that they had found him. He was just absolutely floored. He was so surprised. He couldn't believe it. Why? Because I wore the juice, he said. I wore the juice. (laughs) See, he had learned that lemon juice acted as invisible ink. And so before robbing that bank, (laughs) he sprayed lemon juice all over his face. And he'd even taken a picture to test if it worked. I don't know where the camera was pointing because he thought it worked. (laughs) And he robbed the bank. It didn't work. So don't go home and try this. Apparently, it actually made it harder to rob the bank because he had lemon juice in his eyes. (laughs) So if you want to rob a bank, don't wear lemon juice. Now, why share this story? Well, because this man, in this case, actually inspired two researchers, two social scientists named Dunning and Kruger to discover something now called the Dunning-Kruger effect. They found that some people who know very little about a topic can become completely confident in their expertise of the topic. And others that actually know about the topic are much more humble and less confident in what they know. So the more you know, the the less confident you become, and the the less you know, the more confident you become. So this graph, I I brought a graph for those that uh, helps you kind of see what they mean. You can see that those that know nothing have a great deal of confidence in what they know. And as they gain experience and knowledge, they begin to realize, oh, I really don't know much. And then finally, once they get a little bit more expertise, their their confidence comes up a little bit more. So less knowledge can lead to more confidence, while more knowledge can lead to less confidence. Now, I bet none of us have met people who think they know it all, (laughs) right? But actually know very little. We've also probably met people that know an incredible amount and yet are incredibly humble about what they know. So my question to you is, which would you rather be? (laughs) Would you rather be a know-it-all who knows nothing? Or would you rather be a wise person? I'm going to call them a humble learner. I'd rather be a humble learner, (laughs) right? I don't want to be a know-it-all who doesn't really know anything. In Proverbs, we encounter kind of a wide spectrum of people. We encounter know-it-alls who know nothing to the wise. Here are some of the types of people we encounter in the book of Proverbs. We encounter the wise. These are the people that love and obey God. They are the humble learners. They want to be in a relationship with God. Their, Their faith, their understanding of who God is, and I'm kind of transporting it in today's language, the kind of people that want to be in a relationship with God and are serious about their faith. This isn't just something they they come to and attend. They want to grow, and they want to share. Proverbs calls them other names like the righteous, or upright, or diligent, or those who have understanding, or the prudent. They are the wise. So these are the first types of people in Proverbs. Then uh, we're kind of working back way, backward on that chart. Uh, so we have the, the wise, and then a little less wise, we have the simple. Right? They don't care. <laughs> they don't care one way or the other. They're kind of apathetic. They are the lukewarm people. They don't really want to be good. They also don't really want to be bad. They just want to kind of plod along. These are the simple. 
But we can get a little bit further, a little bit worse than that. We get the fool in the book of Proverbs. The fool are those who actively oppose God, who disobey God, who aren't really interested in God at all, who reject his message. They don't want to live life God's way. They want to live life their way. (laughs) This is the fool. To know God brings wisdom. And if you want to be wise, you actually have to know God. So to reject God, you could be very smart, you could be very intelligent, but you could still be a fool. Proverbs also calls them wicked, lazy, sluggards, lacking sense. But it gets worse. (laughs) They're also the scoffer. They're even one step worse than the fool. They are arrogant and they are unteachable. This is someone who quarrels with others, chooses fights and arguments, and is prideful. They exert their dominance over others. And uh, kind of the the worst know-it-all of all, (laughs) who actually knows nothing, are those that are wise in their own eyes. They are the know-it-all who knows nothing. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see a person who is wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. There's more hope for a fool than for them. These are the people that Dunning and Kruger would say, know a lot, but really know very little. They got the lemon juice in their eyes. They're the opposite of humble learners. But here's the catch-22. Here's the kind of the impossible situation. See, because they know nothing, they don't know that they need to learn something. And so they never get out of learning nothing. (laughs) That's not a very good deal, is it? You don't want to be wise in your own eyes. You don't want to be a scoffer. You don't want to be a fool. You want to be a humble learner. You want to be wise. So my question to you and to me tonight, as we think about ourselves and our lives and our family, is what kind of person are you? Are you wise or simple? Are you a fool, a scoffer, or wise in your own eyes? Would you know it if you were wise in your own eyes? You need the Holy Spirit to come and reveal it to you. You need God to step down into your life and open your eyes to who you are. One of the ways he can do that is through his word through the book of Proverbs, as you begin to encounter the living God and his words, it can open your eyes and your mind and your heart to who you are. See, there is hope for those that are wise in their own eyes. I want to talk about that hope a little bit tonight. There's hope of becoming a humble learner. We do that by by learning about a man, a man named Augur, (laughs) Great names in the book of Proverbs. But he was a humble learner. And we can follow his example if we want to become someone who isn't just a fool or simple, but actually is wise. And so we're going to look at what a humble learner is. We're going to look at what Augur gives us as a model, as an example. The first is that he has a low view of self. So if you want to be a humble learner, have a low view of yourself. Look at the first three verses once again. The sayings of Augur, son of Jacob, an inspired utterance. This man's utterance to Ithiel. I am weary, God, but I can prevail. Surely I am only a brute, not a man. I do not have human understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One. Augur is a model of true humility, true wisdom. And see, he's a nobody, but he's also a somebody. Augur is a nobody. This is the only place in the Bible that you find his name. This is the only place in the Bible that you find his father's name. We don't know who this guy is. Some people actually think he's a foreigner, that he's not an Israelite. See, he's a nobody. But he's also a somebody. He says an oracle. You know that means an inspired utterance, a prophecy. Augur is a wise man and a prophet. He can speak 
on God's behalf. And we see him doing that here in this passage tonight. See, he has a great deal of wisdom, but it doesn't inflate his ego. He does not think highly of himself. He thinks highly of God. He calls himself a brute. A brute. Not a man. I'm an animal. (laughs) I do not have human understanding. I have not learned wisdom. Augur has a low view of himself. That's pretty countercultural. We're not told, told to have a, a low view of ourselves. We're, we're told to have a high view of ourselves. But that actually makes it, makes it harder to learn what God wants to teach us. That makes it harder to understand God and his word. I watched a TED Talk on this Dunning-Kruger effect. I learned that people that have a moderate amount of knowledge on a topic, so kind of those middle people, they tend to realize just how much they don't know. And actual experts in the field... They have a better self-perception of what they know, but they tend to overestimate what others know. So they know a lot, and they think, well, everyone must know how much I know. Maybe that's why when you get in a conversation with someone who is really brilliant, they talk at just another level. (laughs) They assume you must know. The more wise you become, the more you learn, the more you realize your own lack of wisdom. How you just don't know as much as you thought you knew. And if that's not you, I'd be a little concerned. <laughs> but this shouldn't stop us because we want to become humble learners. The humble learner also has a, has a low view of self, but also has a high view of God. It's not just about self-deprecation, oh me, oh my. Like, no, it's I'm low, but God is high. <laughs> God is amazing. Wisdom requires Not only that I grasp how small I am, but how big God is. Now, he's not just like a bigger version of a person. That's not who God is. He does share some likeness with us because he made us to be in his likeness. But he's also completely different than us. He's wholly other. As we we read Augur's words in here, we find that he is amazed by two things. He's amazed by God's creative power and by God's ultimate plan. Verse 4 says, Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Whose hands have gathered up the wind? Who has wrapped up the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Augur is amazed by God's creative power, that God made all of this, (laughs) and that he made all of this. He is amazed by God, God's power to call creation into existence, Genesis 1. If you want to read another creation kind of narrative, you can go to Proverbs chapter 8 and read more about God creating through wisdom, through his son, Christ. But Augur is also amazed at God's plan. So his creative power, his creation, but he's also amazed at God's plan. Remember, Augur is a prophet. He is an oracle. That means he is making a divine utterance. And he prophesies. He prophesies that the Holy One of verse 3 has a son in verse 4. What is his name and what is the name of his son? So he gives us just a glimpse, just a taste of God's big plan. But somehow... The divine one, the holy one, God is a father, (laughs) and he has a son. Something that wouldn't be fully explained into the New Testament. But we stand on this side of the New Testament, and so we know the name of this son. His name is Jesus. (laughs) His name is Christ Jesus. God's big plan is that, that even though creation would be would be marred and broken by sin, he would send his son, the truly wise one, the the truly humble learner, to come and rescue creation, to come and rescue people. And that's what Christ Jesus does. He comes and he rescues us from our sins through the cross. And when we begin to realize how big God's plan is, like God created everything, like I don't know how you can stand 
on the side of the ocean or like even in a forest on a path and not realize just how great God is. But then when you look in the Bible and you find the story of Jesus, I don't know how you can't understand how great God is. And that gives us humility of heart. Helps us think a little bit lower of ourselves and a little bit higher of God. And if you think about it, the gospel, so gospel means good news. The gospel message itself seems foolish, right? The gospel is that the wisest of all men, the wisest of all men, the Holy One's son, let himself be murdered. Let himself be murdered for something he did not do. That's foolish. Unless he was accomplishing something. Unless he was sacrificing himself to pay the penalty for fools, for simpletons, for scoffers, for those who are right in their own eyes. Unless he was rescuing foolish people to turn them into wise people by God's grace. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sins so that we could be filled with the Holy Spirit and saved and begin to understand God's words, begin to understand God's ways, and begin to walk in wisdom, begin to become a humble learner. Maybe you want to be a humble learner. Do you want this? So to become a humble learner begins by repenting of your sins, by saying, I'm broken I have sin that I cannot deal with. I have sin that I cannot address. No matter how many good works I do, that doesn't erase the things I did. But there's, there's someone who can deal with my sin. There's someone who is perfect and who can pay the penalty for my crime. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the wise one. That's what the gospel is. That's the good news that we can be forgiven if we repent and believe in Christ. But this isn't an easy thing to do because our pride rears its ugly head. Verse 13 warns us of haughty eyes. These are eyes that like stare up in defiance against God. They reflect a haughty heart. Haughty heart and haughty eyes, they lead to pain for self and pain for others. They lead to injustice and wrongdoing. You don't want to be right in your own eyes. You don't want to lift your eyes against God. A humble learner has a low view of self and a high view of God. I've been reading an interesting book. I I have not finished this book, but I've really enjoyed what I've read so far. It's called The Death of a Guru. It's the story of a Hindu boy named Rabi. He was born in India, and he becomes a Brahmin priest. Uh, And he eventually becomes a Christian. I'm not to that part yet, uh, but as a teenager, so I've been kind of working through his childhood years and his teenage years. uh, As a teenager, he really understood Hinduism really well. I'm just going to tell you what I read in this book, uh, because my my knowledge is pretty limited. Uh, But he believed... That he was a so he was a Brahmin priest, and his understanding of Hinduism taught that everything is God, right? So the trees are God, the creation's God, the world's God. God is everything. Everything is God. Cows, bugs, nature, you name it, everything is God. And so he followed that to his logical conclusion, and he would sit in front of a mirror, and he would look at himself, and he would look upon God, and he would worship God. He would worship himself in the mirror. Now, I don't know if everyone does that in this faith, but I think it's kind of relatable, actually, that we can think of ourselves, that we can look in our mirrors and say, wow, look how good I look. Maybe you're not looking in an actual mirror, but you're thinking about your career or your knowledge or your family or your accomplishments or whatever. You're looking at yourself and you're thinking, how great am I? That's idolatry. That's worship of self. 
instead of worship of the one true living God. That's treating yourself as divine. Little Robbie, he realized eventually that he wasn't God. He wasn't big G God or like a little G God. He wasn't divine. God was working in his heart. He began to recognize that God was completely different than him. He writes, during my third year in high school, I experienced an increasingly deep inner conflict. My awareness of God as the creator, separate and distinct from the universe he had made, an awareness that had been part of me even as a small boy, contradicted the concept given to me by Hinduism that God was everything, that the creator and the creation were one and the same. I felt torn between these two irreconcilable views. To be a humble learner, you have to have a low view of yourself and a high view of God, and God is distinct and different from us. He was discovering, Rabbi, discovering true wisdom. But he wasn't there yet. He needed to read the Bible, and I'm getting to that part. Uh, in my own readings, you'll have to pick up the book, A Death of a Guru. It's in our church library. But this leads me to point number three. A humble learner has trust in what God says. A humble learner has trust in God's words and God's scripture. Verses 5 through 6 say, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. See, the Bible is, is not just like a nice book of fairy tales. This is a book that we can like, lay as a foundation for our lives that we can trust, that we can bet our lives on. I am betting my eternity on the things that this book says. This book in itself is not like a holy book. It's the message. It's the message that it contains. The story about Christ, the story of the scripture. There isn't anything magical about this. But there is something significant in the message that it contains. The message of God that is flawless, that is perfect. We can't add to it. We can't add to the story because it's complete. It's been written. It isn't quite fulfilled, but it's perfect. So the question is, are you going to trust God and are you going to trust his words? When I was uh, in high school, I went to a Christian camp, uh, and I don't remember uh, a lot of what the speaker said, But I do remember uh, one of the stories he told. I'm going to do my best to retell the story. Uh, And he told the story of the time that he was in college. And he was out with his friends driving. It was a hot summer day, like the day we had today. Uh, Maybe they were driving home or some sort of adventure. And they drove past a bridge that was over a beautiful river. And they're like, wow, wouldn't it be great to go for like a little swim in the river? And how fun, like we could jump off the bridge into the river and go for a swim. That would be incredibly refreshing this day. And so they get out, park their car, and begin to get ready to jump off the bridge into uh, the river. And they do see a sign that says, warning, no jumping off the bridge. They're like, ah, we're going to jump. We're going to enjoy the water. They're about ready to jump in, and a police car pulls up beside them, and the police officer rolls down his window and says, we've already pulled several bodies out of the water this year. Rolls the window back up, drives off. They didn't jump. (laughs) Apparently, there were power lines under the bridge. So if they had jumped, they would have died. They trusted the words once they had a few extra (laughs) But initially, they didn't trust the sign. So what words will you trust? What words will you base your life upon? The words out there that come to us through different means and seem to be changing all the time, whether it's what you're reading in the the news or watching on TV or or your friends are telling you, are you going to trust your life on those words? Are you going to trust your life on something that is unchangeable? and true, the word of God. I think we can trust our lives on his word. They hold eternal life. So a humble learner has a low view of self, a high view of God, and trust in what God says. My fourth one, my final one, is a prayer 
for contentment. A humble learner has a prayer for contentment. This is the only prayer in the book of Proverbs, verses 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Sounds a little bit like another's prayer. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Do not slander a servant to their master or they will curse you and you will pay for it. The first thing he prays for is to keep falsehood and lies far from him. Why do we lie? Why do we lie about others or to get ahead? Verse 10 kind of talks about slandering. That means like saying something that's not true about someone else to hurt them and their reputation. Why do we lie? Because of idolatry, actually. <laughs> because we want some, something or someone or, or, or something to happen more than we want God. More than, we, more than resting in the contentment of what God has provided for us. So we're willing to manipulate the circumstances. That's idolatry. And so a humble learner has to pray for contentment. God, would I find my contentment in you, not in these other things, not in the things I can get, not in the things that I want. Would I find my contentment in you? The second thing Augur prays for is for God to give him just what he needs, <laughs> to not give him any more, because if he gives him too much, well, he might walk away from God. Not give him any less so that, well, he doesn't steal and dishonor God's name and, uh, and bring God a bad reputation. Do we ever, like, pray that God would give us less money? <laughs> God, give me less money. Or, God, would you provide for this need only if it will, like, increase my love for you? If this is going to take me away from you, don't give me more money. Lord, don't give me that promotion. Lord, uh, don't have us inherit that money it's going to take my heart further from you. Don't have this person give me that so that I can depend on you. Christianity.com tells the story of a cricket player in the late 1800s. This player, this is kind of an old illustration, but I think it's relevant. The player's name was C.T. Studd. Uh, He became a Christian uh, as a cricket player, uh, but it wasn't until six years later, he wasn't really playing cricket anymore, that he heard Dwight L. Moody, so famous uh, preacher. And that's when he kind of got serious about his faith. He gave his all to Christ. He became a missionary, and he worked with Hudson Taylor in China, a famous Chinese missionary. He's famous for this saying, some wish to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. It's a pretty good slogan. <laughs> when he was 25 years old, in 1885, he inherited about $145,000. Now, it was in pounds, uh, but I don't know exactly how that works. <laughs> and to give you some idea, I looked it up on a couple different websites. It said that's about $4 million today. So a significant amount of money. And he decided instead of keeping that money, he would give it all away. Give everything away. He said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. His words echo Jesus' words in Mark 8.35, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. He gave money to Dwight L. Moody that he used to help found Moody Bible Institute. He gave money to George Mueller, who used some of it in his orphanage. He gave money to the Salvation Army. He gave money to Hudson Taylor's China Inland Mission. He gave some of his money to his wife, and then she gave it away. (laughs) And that's incredibly foolish if this is all we have. That's incredibly foolish if the gospel isn't true. But if the gospel is true, it's incredibly wise. It's incredibly wise if God is real. Maybe God is calling you to give your money away. I know people that have done that. 
But maybe he's not. Maybe he's calling you to something else. But I do know that he is calling you to give yourself to him fully. Without any reservation, without holding anything back. God, you can have everything but my money. Or God, you can have everything but my career. Or God, you can have everything but my kids. Or God, you can have everything but my, my spouse. God is asking you to give him everything. At all. Because he wants you. He wants to give you something in return. He wants to give you himself. And that is more precious than anything in this world. (laughs) The creator of this world. And if you do, if you say, God, I'm going to give my everything to you. I'm not going to hold back. There's great reward in that. It's the wisest decision you could ever ever, ever make. So if you want to become a humble learner, have a low view of self, have a high view of God, trust in what God says, have a prayer for contentment. So what's the solution to the Dunning-Kruger effect? (laughs) It's an auger heart. (laughs) to become a humble learner, to follow Augur's example. But who was Augur following? He was following the Holy One's son. So follow Augur as he follows Christ Jesus. Together, Christ can turn fools into people of wisdom. By his grace, he can take you and me and make us into a humble learner. Let me pray.